Nobody cares. Is there a God? Nobody cares. What's morality? What's right? What's wrong? Survival. No one had time to be depressed. No one could claim or want to be an individual. Life was tough. To survive, you need to be with other people. And you had to grow a thick skin. Nobody cared about your problems. Like New Guinea. Doesn't matter your age. You complain a bit too much, someone smacks you on the head. Now, the nice thing about the Stone Age era or people who just had to move constantly is that you live in Oakland for a few hours, then you move to Berkeley. Then you move to Sacramento, then you move to Nevada, then you move to Seattle. You don't have time to create relationships with the land. Relationships happen only when you spend a good amount of time with any one thing. If you come to class on Thursday and my dean is here instead of me and says to you, Amir had a stroke and died, I doubt very much any of you are going to shed a tear. It's only our third or fourth meeting. If on the other hand, this was the last day of the semester, it may be that some of you don't like me, but you desperately need the grade. Because of the relationship you have with your grade, i.e. your future, confusion, anxiety, dread, they're going to overtake you, and you're going to bombard my dean with questions. But what, who's going to grade me? Am I going to pass? Am I going to fail? Am I going to get an incomplete? For those of you who have grown to like me after 15 weeks, yes, you may go home a little sad. And we'll talk about emotions a bit later. <sighs> you have to understand how wonderful it was some 50, 60,000 years ago to not think about things that are abstract, your identity, meaning, purpose that are out there. You want to know who you are? Be a good warrior. Kill a couple of animals. Bring food to your parents. That's it. Find a cave. Time passed and um, people began to know how the seasons work. They also began to know how to plant seeds, how to make the wheel how to domesticate tame animals. It just didn't happen overnight. And the moment you're able to domesticate animals, the moment you're able to cultivate the land and force it to grow food, for the first time now you have settlement. People make a place called Oakland. If you want food, you just go to Safeway. 10 minutes. A task that used to take sunrise to sunset now takes 20 minutes. And now that you have about 10, 15 hours time on your hand, the question is, what the hell do you do with it? There is food. There is shelter, there is clothing, something that occupied a good amount of human space. You thought about this stuff all the time. You felt about them all the time. Your fears had to do with food, shed, and clothing. 
<laughs> but the moment the basic needs of survival were at hand, something really strange happened. Some people just had a lot of time. What the hell does all of this mean? I come to class, I sit to this guy, I, and listen to this guy just talk endlessly about nonsense. And then I go home or I go to work. Customers, they ask about ridiculous things. My job is about ridiculous things. I make some relationships. Some of them survive, some of them pass away. And then I get old and I get sick. And once in a while, I begin to examine my life and I realize it amounts to nothing. So for those of you in this class who self-examine and think a lot, your remedy is not therapists. Your remedy is not alcohol or drugs. Make sure you're always busy physically. If you don't have money, go to Home Depot, steal some plants and a shovel, just go to places and start digging a hole and planting these buckets in them. That's how you keep yourself busy. And when you're physically busy, your intellect comes down and says, okay, how do I dig another hole? So remember, whenever you think about yourself, about your life, about meaning, identity, whatever it may be, it's because you are privileged. You have time to sit and think. And if you don't want to sit and think, life forces you to sit and think. So for those of you who want to know the birth of philosophy, the birth of human reflection, it really, for the most part, has to do with privilege. Some people not working physically, having their basic needs, and so they just sit and think about things. My parents, when they came here, they had a car wash. It made a good amount of money, so I went to school. Not to do art, not to do music, to do philosophy. I just had some questions. Imagine if my mom was sick, or as immigrants, we had no money, and there was no money to buy a business. What do you think I'd be here? And so you get some people like Auguste Comte, father of sociology, as some would claim. He comes forth and says, you know what? Initially, we imagined that our gods lived in the forest, the jungles, the gods of Pan for panic. Then we evolved. We said our gods live in the sky, not just one god, many gods. Then we evolved even more. We believed in a one single deity, Yahweh, Jesus, Allah. Then we evolved some more and we gave birth to science. Now you can actually open things up and understand what lives inside them. There is no need for God. <laughs> And I suppose if you happen to be an American in this culture, 21st century, you can say, I don't even need science. I just believe in myself. <sighs> Do you have any questions or comments before we continue? Well, seven. I have a hard time like turning my thoughts into questions. 
the truth is you shouldn't be given assignments at all. All you need to do right now for the first, maybe the next couple of decades in your life, you just need a lot of experience. And you're going to be pushed around by those, hopefully, you know, being pushed around by experiences, most of which you won't like. And then there comes a point after you're just tired of being an emotional junkie and just complaining to your friends about how pathetic your life is and you are and all that. There comes a point where you say, you know what, I just want to understand things. I just don't want to feel anymore. And then you look at your notebooks, your journals, and you say, it's all trash, it's all junk. Filled with emotions but zero understanding. But in order to understand, um, you need to kind of look at things you want to feel, but you say, no, I've been there, I've done that. And uh, to be able to understand anything, first of all, you have to kind of walk away from your experiences and stand on the, above it and look down. And for the first time, you're going to have certain feelings and emotions, a different set of feelings and emotions with different qualities to them. And then you want to understand that, but you can't. Now, one of the things you need to understand is something we spoke about yesterday in my class is that ever since we landed on this planet, uh, our occupation really has been to solve problems. Problems of food, of shelter, of clothing, of relationships, of God, of gender, of sexuality, you name it, politics, injustice, racism, it doesn't really matter. Human beings are designed to solve problems because life is complicated. Your task is to go out there, listen to a couple of audios, and come up with a question that's decent. That's a problem. Your task is to create a question. Now, if you're not trained, and most people aren't, if you're not trained, what's going to happen is, well, slowly, you're going to be frustrated. You keep trying, but it's going nowhere. And then you're going to feel anxiety. Then you're going to find yourself a little confused. Then your self-confidence is going to be impacted. Then you're going to be a little sad. Then you're going to be a little depressed. Then you're going to be a little angry. And then you say, you know what? I'm just going to drop the class. <laughs> Nobody should be given assignments for a long time, but it's a crummy system. I have to give you a grade. That's what we do. Just do the best you can. Your task here is not to be creative and not to ask questions that will inspire any of us in this classroom. Your task is to just pass the class. Should you become curious and sincere, and, you know, that's good for you. That's an added bonus. But for now, just pass the class. You're 19. You need to be done with Laney by the time you're 20. You need to be done with a four-year school by the time you're 22. You need to be done with your master's degree by the time you're 24, 25, and hopefully a PhD or something. Because what you need in life to survive is power. Right now, you're far too young for intellectual power. You need physical power. You need to graduate. You need to make money. And if there are any cracks in your relationships with your friends, your family members, fix them, especially if they happen to be traumatic. They're not going to go anywhere. And as you get older, they become worse. Anyone else? Uh, Anna? Yeah. Um, is it like possible or like beneficial to seek out like physical power and intellectual power at the same time? With any power that you get, you get drunk by it. And you're going to be profoundly abusive in your own way, and there are different degrees of, you know, uh, intoxication and, and bullying, okay? As some people do it very eloquently, and some people just do it very meanly, you know? Um, and there comes a point in your intoxication where you just have drank a bit too much power, and then you begin to puke. You get sick. And in sickness, you become a little humble, if you want to use that word. And um, you become tame. You tame the power and you begin to use it differently. So the initial uh, journey towards power, first, there's a good amount of poverty because if you, don't, if you have something, you're not going to look for it. 
And if you're looking for it, it's because of greed, and it's something that's about our biology. For the past many, many thousands, if not millions of years, our future has always been uncertain. That's why you have a freezer. That's why you have five refrigerators in your garage. That's why you have a savings account. Deep down, something in your bio biology says things could go sour at any time. That's why you have 25 friends, just in case 20 of them die, at least you have five. So you need to have greed inside you. It protects your future. Okay? And so there is a period where you don't have, you move towards having it, you have it, you get drunk. Then after some experience, you tame it. Or you come to certain understandings. And naturally, it just becomes tamed. And then you use it for the best. It's kind of like the Spider-Man movie. With great power comes great responsibility. But that comes much, much, much later. Good luck. Anyone else? Um, Adrian. Uh, and no one has denied anything. The Buddha didn't deny his presence towards other people, neither did Jesus, neither did Malcolm X. There, is, um, there are some major flaws to the way we have been wired. We don't enjoy learning things that are new and things that contradict our position. That's just the way things are. Now, the older you are, the more difficult it is for you to change. Because... Um, You know, when you're young, and one of the nice things about confusion is like, I don't know if you do any concrete work, but you make a form, you pour concrete, and it's relatively soft, and it's going to remain soft for a few hours, depending on the nature of the concrete that you've poured. If it's too wet, it'll be soft for a day or so. If it's not too wet, it'll harden after a few hours, okay? Now, when you're young and confused, you better hope that someone with... Some intellectual prowess, someone who's been there, who's done that, you know, can walk into your life. Kind of like Costa Mata and uh, Mike Tyson. Tyson could have been approached by a gangbanger, but it was his luck that he was approached by an older man who was a boxer, who knew how to train, someone who had potential to be great. Okay? Now, some of it is luck. And the word happiness, it comes from the word hap, basically means luck. Now, in a culture such as this, where it's always how to, it doesn't tell you, listen, Adrian, you can do the best you can, but you're just going to be a loser. It doesn't matter what you do. In a culture such as this, no. The promises are always the Garden of Eden, which is really not true. It's never been true. The idea of happiness is relatively new. It's about maybe 100 years old. Okay? So the idea of knowledge or wisdom or learning or transformation, it has never been denied to anyone. If your question is, well, how does one become receptive to those things? I don't know. And I say I don't know because lots of people out there have tried and they have failed. We don't really know what makes someone become curious. We don't know how someone becomes interested. We don't really know how someone becomes receptive. Now, one of the things about learning is it has two branches. You read a book about justice. When you write a book about justice, it's theoretical. It lives inside your head. And you hang out with a couple of your loser friends and you talk about your ideas. And you inspire them. And they're excited to hang out with you. Nothing wrong with that. It's much better than smoking. Okay? 
Now, the second branch of learning is, well, how the hell do you apply what you know? I know you want to redecorate your house. I know you have great ideas. I know you have the money to buy brand new slabs and tiles and this and that. Do you know how to demolish? Do you know how to put the drawers in there? That, you need a different type of skills. And the truth is both are needed. You need theory and practice. The problem with practice is it's messy. Not messy the soccer player. It's messy. Lots of noise, lots of dirt, lots of dust. And you usually have to vacate your premises. So remember, Jesus Christ is not a problem, Adrian, you are. Anyone else? By the way, I, I, I don't mean to, it's not personal, I'm just, no, no, in general, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? That's it? Eska? Your uh, video essay, if you will, on the allegory of the cave made it sound like you have a specific opinion that it is not impossible to escape the shadows of other people. Now, a large portion of the allegory of the cave is actually not how you escape the shadows or understand them, but returning to inform and teach others, which did not really get touched on as much. I was curious, and I saw I said this in my question to you. Do you have a particular either uh, nihilistic or cynic, uh, cynical view to your philosophy? And do you have a penchant towards hard determinism? I, I don't know what hard determinism is. It's uh, usually spoken. A lack of free will. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. Do you have children? I do. How many? One. Age? She's 11. 11. You know you fall in love with some loser out there. Yep, been there, done that. And um, initially, you have some psychological narratives that you're exempt from the slings and arrows of life. Life is never going to tarnish the sort of feelings you have for your companion. Just give it some time. And you realize that you want him to go to Home Depot and never come back. Just don't want to be around them as much. And then uh, during a, a romantic setting, you look at your companion and say, let's have a family. And so you guys have some stupid exercise. And she comes to you and she says, I'm pregnant. That's if you haven't adopted, but it's actually from both of you. And then you have all these narratives again. I'm going to go to Home Depot and buy a crib. I'm going to Lucky's and buy socks. I'm going to be the best dad, best this, best that. And just wait a little. And you realize it's far more complicated than you ever imagined. And I suppose the point I'm trying to make is this. Romanticism only exists when you haven't been touched by certain realities of life. And the moment life touches you, and the moment you have this idea that you can be a great teacher, but you go out there. I mean, first, I don't think people can be good teachers, but that's for a different day. <clears throat> despite all the information you may have had, despite all the experiences you may have had, you may realize, in fact, you will realize, you'll be forced to realize that nobody cares. And you don't even have to trust your own experiences. Look at history. Consider the greatest hero you've ever had, the first hero. Gilgamesh. What the hell did he do? Did he write a book? Yeah, on the wall. Why couldn't he talk to people? People are stupid. Who can understand? Now, 
Let me give it to you this other way. How old are you? 35. You're 35. I'm 60. I have no doubt, Scott, you can write a great essay about getting old. Yeah. yeah, but you don't know how it feels to be 70, to lose abilities. You can imagine, you can fantasize, but fantasy and reality are very, very different. You can read the biography of Malcolm X, you can praise it, you can talk about it. But you and him are two different animals from two different worlds. Before we talk about the allegory of the cave, we need to talk about Plato a little. Before we talk about Plato, we have to talk about Socrates. Before we talk about Socrates, we have to talk about Diotima. Before we talk about Diotima, we have to talk about love. Before we talk about love, we have to talk about the human being and the five senses, memories, life, advertisement of all sorts. See, you and I are in a very difficult place in life, and uh, let me tell you a story. There is um, an animal out there, it's a fish, salmon. Salmons are interesting little animals. You know, they live on top of a hill, form of an egg. The force of the water pushes them downward. And as they go downward, slowly they hatch. And by the time you get to the bottom of the pool, they're like a quacking fish, having a good time. They have friends, they get married, they have children, they buy business, they sell businesses, they go through divorces, they do Tinder, you know, some of them are sex workers, all that. They're truly American. <clears throat> and despite being married, Despite having parents, living in a society with lots of friends, at a certain point in the life of the salmon fish, says, and it happens organically, intuitively, instinctually, I don't belong here. I don't know why salmons are condemned to go through that particular psychological trauma, but they do. All of a sudden they say, this is not my home. I want to go back. And they do. And they do something that fish can't really do, which is to fly. And they do fly. And they do this at the worst time of the year, spring, where the bears are out and they're hungry. And out of the thousand fish that fly upwards, five get to the destination. A destination they've never seen before, never been before. And they are guided by their intuition. Not thinking, not reflecting, not reading books, not the memories of all the things I've gone through, intuition. And it is unvarnished, uncontaminated. Now, the funny thing about the salmon fish is that once they find their home, and I don't know how they do it, I'm not a fish, they lay a couple of eggs and they die. Human beings are very, 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 very different. First, if there was any intuition to you, that was destroyed, you got five. And then from the age five onwards, you're a victim to all sorts of advertisement, inward advertisement, outward advertisements, conflicts, confusions. You stand no chance. The best you can do really is grab a book, a good shadow, hang on to it and hope that you'll have tiny glimpses of illumination, some clarity. That's the best you can hope for. You're not going to be receptive to anyone telling you what to do. That's not the way this culture works. That's not the way you work because you are from this culture. A salmon fish, what at least you can infer from its life is that it has no problem walking away from the entire things that he or she has created. It walks away. We call it depression in the human world. I don't know if salmon experiences depression. All I know is that they just turn around and swim the other way. And I have no doubt if salmons could talk, talk you know, 
the wife would say, honey, what's wrong with you? I don't know. I look at you and I feel like you're a stranger. I'm your wife. Imagine if the salmons could talk and the kids would say, hey, dad, where are you going? Who are you? I'm your son. You may, but I don't really care for you no more. And the salmon, unlike you and I, they don't suffer from guilt or shame. You and I have been in relationships. You know, there are moments you want to walk away. You've had it. But what happens? Shame, guilt, remorse. What is this person going to do? What am I going to do? What's God going to say? And so you go back into the cave. That's what we are. That's what we do. We are enormously complicated. And every question that you ask, it branches out into a thousand and one different things. It's just best not to talk philosophy at all. 